Y'all ready? Yes. Say, I'm ready. ready. Oh, y'all pretty ready? Yeah, that's pretty ready. Tell your neighbor, I'm ready. Oh, uh, let's see. Better tell your neighbor a little louder. I don't think they're ready. Ready. Ready? ready? All right, y'all hold on. Here, here. Watch this. Watch this. 287 B.C. Anybody around back then? Okay, then you won't know if I'm telling the truth or not, will you? 287 B.C. Something very incredible and special happened on the other side of the world in Greece. In 287 B.C., the most famous mathematician Greece has ever produced was born. His name was... Archimedes. If you ever took a basic physics class or studied world history back in high school or for some of you younger folk, maybe you went to the movie theater and you saw Indiana Jones in 2023, the dial of destiny, you got introduced to Archimedes. We don't know for certain, but it's believed that in his mid-teens, he got on a boat and he went to a place called Alexandria. And Alexandria was famous because it had the largest library in the world at the time, a massive library. It's believed Archimedes studied there for a number of years before going back to Syracuse, Italy. Now, Syracuse is a part of Italy now, but it was actually a part of Greece then. Greece kind of owned that whole portion of real estate over in that part of the world when Archimedes was alive. In fact, they owned it until 212 BC when the Romans came over and said, We want it. And they laid siege to Syracuse. And they were able to hold on for a while in Syracuse, mostly because of Archimedes. He was an inventor and he invented all kinds of war machines and different things that helped them fight against the Romans. They didn't defeat them. The Romans finally got in. They finally took over. And they actually killed Archimedes in the battle when Syracuse fell. Archimedes is best known today for what you probably studied in school about him. And that is his principle of hydrostatic. Y'all remember that? I asked a, a young man to help me. Would you come up here real quick? Come up here. I gotta, let me grab this microphone so he can talk on the microphone. Now, we didn't set this up. I didn't tell him what I was going to do. Nothing. I just asked if he would help. All right. Tell everybody your name. My name is Noah. Noah. What a great name. Can you all give Noah a round of applause? Noah, have you, um, you know a lot about Archimedes' principle of hydrostaticness? No. No. Okay. Well, that's okay. Um, let me ask you this. Do you know what makes things sink or float? Boats can float. Okay, hold this real close to your mouth. Boats can float. Boats can float. That's a good thing. But if we played a game of sink or float, you think you could guess what will sink or what will float? For example... And I know the people on the radio can't see this, so we'll try to describe it. Here in my hands, I have a... Rock. A pebble. A pebble. It's a rock. You're, you're not wrong, but it's a pebble. It's super small, isn't it? In fact, this rock is so small, I put it on a postal scale this morning, and I measured it. It weighs less than 0.1 ounce. It's tiny. Do you think if I dropped this rock into this bucket of water, it will sink or float? Sink. You think it'll sink? What do y'all think? You think Noah's right? Yeah. All right, say amen if you think he's right. Yeah. All right, let's try it. Come over here, Noah. I want you to watch it real close because you're going to have to tell everybody what happens. Ready? Tell them what happened. It sunk. So you were right. It sunk. And you didn't even know anything about Archimedes' principle, did you? All right, yeah. now you said boats can float. What do I have here? A boat. A boat, that's right. Do you all know humans just built the biggest boat ever called the Icon of the Seas? 
The icon of the seas is a massive cruise ship. It's not even in service yet, but they're testing it right now. Make sure it floats. That's one of the things they want to make sure before they put a bunch of people on it. But this thing is massive. Over 250,000 tons. A quarter of a million tons. And they're going to put that thing on water. They already have to make sure it floats. This boat right here weighs over 150 times more than that pebble. Okay? Do you think it's going to sink or float? Float. You think it's going to float. You ready? Y'all think it's going to float? Put it in there. What did it do? Float. It floats. What's this? A football. A Nerf football, isn't it? Okay, you want to test it, make sure that's what it is? Now this is over 500 times heavier than that pebble. And it's a lot bigger. Do you think it's going to sink or float? Float. What do y'all think? Going to sink or float? Float, float. All right, ready? They can probably see this one. It floated. It floated. Can you go get that ball? All right. What do you think is going to happen to this? Now, this is big. This is a big ball. It's pretty heavy, too, but it's big. What do you think is going to happen? Sink or float? Float. What do y'all think? All right, let's see what happens. It floats. It floats. All right. Thank you all. Y'all give Noah a round of applause. So he, he didn't know anything about Archimedes. He didn't know anything about Archimedes' principle. That's what his principle of hydrostatics is just known today. It's just called Archimedes' principle. He didn't know anything about it. Most of y'all probably don't know anything about it, yet you know how it works. You know what sinks and floats. His principle is also sometimes called the principle of buoyancy. Because it is the principle that tells you if something is going to sink or float. His, now, Archimedes didn't invent this. This really isn't Archimedes' principle, is it? It's God's principle. God put this principle into the workings of the universe long before Archimedes ever lived. You, know, you want to know how we know that principle had been around before Archimedes? Because we've found boats that are older than Archimedes. Archimedes got on a boat to go study at a library before anybody had ever discovered this principle. They were making boats float. We happen to know a guy in the Bible by the name of Noah who built a boat, a really big boat. And when the rain came, what did that boat do? It floated. Now, Noah didn't know Archimedes' principle. He couldn't explain the principle of hydrostatics to you or the principles of buoyancy. He couldn't explain what made it float, but he was still able to build a boat that would float, right? So here's what I'm trying to, to get at, because some of you, we've been doing this, this series called The Path. And the biggest objections I've been getting, people are writing in, texting in, calling me, stopping me in Walmart, coming over to visit with me when I'm eating lunch or whatever. And, and, and here's what I'm hearing from a lot of people. A lot of people are saying, you know, hey, I think all this stuff is really good. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I just don't think it works anymore. Like, I, I, I don't think it works in our world. I don't think it works in our culture. Some have said, Pastor, listen, religion is not about rules. You're talking to us about all these rules. Religion is about relationship, and I would agree with that. And, and they'll, they'll go on and say, I have a relationship with Jesus, so I don't need all these rules you're talking about. And so what I'm trying to tell you today through this is this. We're not talking about rules. If you think we've been talking about rules, you've missed the point. We're talking about principles. The principle of the path, not the rules of the path. The principle of the path. Because principles are different than rules. Rules can be broken. Principles cannot. A principle is at work whether you believe it or not. If you get on a cruise ship, let's just say the icon of the seas, the biggest one ever built, you can go out on your balcony, 
on that massive ship floating across an ocean, and you can take a pebble, less than 0.1 ounces, and you can throw it off your balcony, and it's going to sink to the bottom whether you believe it's going to or not. Because it's a principle. Gravity is a principle. You don't have to believe in gravity for it to work. You don't have to be able to explain gravity for it to work. You jump off the roof of your house, it's just going to work. <laughs> you can believe you're going to fly all you want, but gravity is going to work whether you want it to or not. I remember when my little boy Peter, he was real little, and his bed was on the far side of the room. He'll probably kill me for telling this story. He was probably four years old. And we, we just hear this cry come from his room. And so we jump up, we spring over there, and we go in. And he's laying in the middle of the floor, and he's laying there, and he's crying. He's hurt. And we finally say, what, what happened? What would you do? And he said, I was trying to fly like Superman <laughs> from my bed to my closet. And I didn't quite make it. And we said, son, you, you're not Superman. You can't fly. And he said, but I sure thought I could, Daddy. You can think you can, but there's a principle at work. You can break a rule, but you can't break a principle, at least not without consequences. You can break Archimedes' principle when you're building your next cruise ship or your next boat, but if you do, it's going to sink to the bottom of the ocean because it's a principle. See, what I'm trying to tell you is you don't have to believe these things. These things still work. You don't have to accept these things as truth, but they're still truth. You don't have to believe that that rock's going to go to the bottom, but whether you believe it or not, it's going to go to the bottom. I also want you to understand that just like Archimedes didn't invent this principle, this principle was at work all around people long before Archimedes, he just learned how to tap into it. He learned how to explain it. And because he was able to tap into it and explain it, we can now build ships that weigh over 250,000 tons because we're leveraging a principle that he discovered. And what I'm trying to get you to understand spiritually is this. If you will tap into these principles and leverage them in your life, they are going to work and they are going to allow you to do greater things than you can currently do. They're going to allow, them to allow you to go places and do things and experience God in ways you're not experiencing God right now. But you've got to tap into the principles. Some of you may not believe it, but whether you believe it or not, it's going to work. There's really just one thing I need you to understand today and next week as we're talking about some of these big principles in Scripture, and that is this. You've got to understand that understanding and obeying God's principles is going to produce blessings in your life. When you understand and you obey, those two things have to go hand in hand. You can understand Archimedes' principle, but if you don't obey it, what's going to happen? You're going to sink. <laughs> so you've got to understand it, and then you've got to obey it. If you do those two things with God's principles... It's going to produce blessings in your life. Now, in the same way, if you do the opposite, if you violate God's principles, if you ignore God's principles, or if you otherwise just disobey God's principles, in any area of your life where God has put these principles in place, it's going to produce something different than blessing. It's going to produce pain. It's going to produce hardship. It's going to produce tragedy. It's going to produce something you don't want to happen. Because whether you believe it or not, the principle is already there and the principle is already at work. So today I want to talk to you about two principles that we find in God's Word. And there are many, there's so many we could talk about. But I really want to talk about these principles because these are principles that are kind of guardrails for us on the path that God wants us to walk in life. And if we obey these principles, if we understand these principles, there's blessing in store for us. The first one is this. It's called the principle of the harvest. The principle of the harvest. There's so much we could say about this principle and really all the principles we're going to talk about this week and next week. But, I mean, they could be their own sermon series, in fact. But my goal is just to kind of introduce you to them 
and hopefully you can see the principle at work and perhaps even dare to obey the principle and follow the principle and see what happens. Because I know that understanding and obeying God's principles is going to produce blessings in your life. The concept of the harvest is very popular in the Bible. It's a very popular biblical illustration. It's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus mentions and uses this principle a lot. And I think there's a good reason for that. During the biblical times, most people were agricultural people. This was a very easy principle for people to see and to know and to experience. Now, some of you, many of you in our church, make your living from agriculture. You plant things or you grow things or you take care of animals. You make your living from it, and so it's easy for you to understand. But I promise you this, even if you don't have a green thumb, even if you're one of those people who plants something and it never grows, or you plant something and it grows for a little while and then you kill it, you're a plant murderer. Some of you are. <laughs> You murder those plants, poor things. But even if you're one of those people, you, like Noah, who didn't understand Archimedes' principle, couldn't explain it, you still know the principle of the harvest. You can still see it. You're still going to be able to tell me if it's going to sink or it's going to float. The principle outlined in the Bible comes in many different forms and many different ways. I want to share just a few of them with you really quick. One of the ways it's talked about is when it comes to biblical generosity. It's not just used when we're talking about tithing or giving money to the church either. If you'll look with me in Leviticus chapter 19 verses 9 through 10, for example, it says this, when you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap, you're not to harvest the very edge of your field or to gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes. He says, leave them for the poor and the resident alien. I am the Lord your God. So God gives this command here to his people in the Old Testament. He says, when you harvest, when you go out to the field to, to, to get the harvest, he says, don't harvest everything. Leave a little bit out on the edges. Leave a little bit on the vine so that poor people can come behind, the people who don't have enough, the people who don't have anything, can come behind and they'll have something. They'll have a little bit. They'll have something to eat. He's saying be generous with your harvest. I remember being 15 because when I was 15, I was really poor. If you were poor when you were 15, say amen. amen. The rest of y'all rich people, sorry people. <laughs> you were rich at 15. My goodness. I was poor at 15. I mean really poor. I didn't have nothing. I had to depend on my parents for everything. It's a bad place to be. Hope I'm never there again. Glad they're still alive, just in case, though. <laughs> but I was poor at 15. And when I was 15, my cousin Jay called me one day. He didn't call me on the phone. We didn't have those when I was 15. He called me like this. Hey, Peter, come here. That's how we used to call people. And so I went over, and I was talking to Jay, and he said, hey, I got a good idea. My buddy, he had a buddy. Jay's a year older than me. He's 16, just got his driver's license. And his buddy, his dad planted watermelons, hundreds of acres of watermelons and cantaloupes. And he said, my buddy's dad said, we can go and pick all the watermelons and cantaloupes we want. We can sell them. We can make some money. I thought that was a pretty good plan. So we went and asked my dad and his dad if we could have a couple days to go do that. It's the middle of summer. They said, sure, go do it. And so we got the biggest trailer we thought we could pull with a truck. And we hooked it up, and we put bumper boards on the sides of it, and we went out there, and we picked watermelons and cantaloupes all afternoon one day. Because see, what had happened was this man had planted hundreds of acres, and the harvest crew had come through, and they had harvested that field once. They had harvested that field twice. They had come back through it a third time, and there just wasn't enough left to justify keeping them all there, keeping the crew there. But there's a lot of leftovers still there. And so his dad, being generous, just said, y'all go do whatever you want with them. So we went, we picked a whole flatbed trailer full of watermelons and cantaloupes. We got up at 3.30 the next morning, and we drove to San Antonio to the farmer's market. And I tell you, everybody at the farmer's market hated us. Because if they had $4 a melon on their sign, we put three fifty. <laughs> and if they got tired of everybody buying their melons from us, and they went down to three fifty, we put three twenty five. 
And if they went to 325, we went to three even. If they went to three even, we went to 250. We didn't care. We just wanted to sell those melons and go get another trailer load. Right? Because we didn't have anything in them. We hadn't paid for the water. We hadn't paid for the seed. We hadn't paid for the fertilizer. We hadn't paid for the tractor that planted them. All we had paid for was our labor, which when I was 15 was worth virtually nothing. And I remember at at the end of that first day, which was like 10 o'clock in the morning, we were sold out. We were coming back, and we were counting all that money. And we divided it up amongst the three of us, and I was holding $1,000 in my hand. And I thought I was rich. (laughs) I mean, I was like, woo, I just won the mega billions or whatever it's called. You know, I thought, wow, life don't get no better than this. And so we went and did it another day and another day and another day until there were just no more watermelons left. And some summers we'd catch a rain shower and that would last even longer. And we'd just sell those melons until they were just all gone. I paid for a couple of semesters of college with that money. Because I didn't party it away. I didn't waste it. I didn't go buy a bunch of stuff with it. I tucked it away in my bank account. And see, that was all from the generosity of somebody who said, you can have the edge of my field. You can have what's left. It's better than it rotten. It's better than it just staying here. It's better than coyotes eating. Go get you some of it. Right? That's a principle of the harvest at work. It was a blessing for my life. It was a blessing for his life. And I believe a blessing God will honor and credit to his account. It can be simple like that. The principle of the harvest is also used in Scripture to outline not generosity to others, but our generosity to the Lord as well. I'm not going to beat this drum real hard. I'm not going to beat on it too long because you've heard about it already. But look at Proverbs 3, 9, for example. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. This is the principle of the harvest. He says, then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. What did I tell you a minute ago? If you tap into God's principles, if you understand them and obey them, what happens? It produces blessings. Full barns are a blessing. (laughs) Full vats are a blessing. Paul said it like this to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. The point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap. Or harvest sparingly. The person who sows generously will also reap or harvest generously. In other words, the more you plant, the more you're going to harvest. It's a principle of the harvest. Each person should do as he's decided in his heart. Hold on to that for a second. We're going to come back to it. Not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. Now, how can God say this in verse 7? I mean, this doesn't sound um, like, like something we're sub- he's twisting our arm to do. He says each person can do as he's decided in his heart to do, not reluctantly or out of compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. See, God can say that because God knows what's going to happen. God understands his own principle his own principle of the harvest. He understands that you're going to get what you deserve, that you're going to reap what you sow. So he says, hey, if you want to reap a little, sow a little. If you want to reap a lot, reap, uh, sow a lot. And he understands that the more your faith grows in this area and the more you start to sow and the more you start to trust and the more you start tapping into this principle, the more blessed you're going to be and the more you're going to want to do it. The hardest part, I think, when it comes to generosity is taking those first steps in those early years. That's when it's the hardest. But after you start experiencing the goodness of God through it, you want to do it more and more and more and more. Because you understand that this principle brings blessing to your life. The principle of the harvest is also at play when it comes to how we serve the Lord. Not just how we give to the Lord, not just how we give to others, but also in how we serve God. Look at Galatians 6, 9 and 10. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap or we will harvest at the proper time if we don't give up. 
Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. You see, your faithfulness to God and your obedience to the Lord and your service to the King of kings and the Lord of lords produces a great harvest for the kingdom and blessing for your life. It's the principle of the harvest. You don't have to believe that it works. You don't have to believe in it at all, but it's still there. Let me share one more with you. This is one of the things Jesus said about the principle of the harvest. And here he's using it to talk about evangelism. Because the principle of the harvest also works in spiritual ways as well. Matthew 9, 37 through 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, this is one harvest we should all want to take part in. This is different than a watermelon harvest. This is different than a cantaloupe harvest. This is the harvest of souls. This is sinners turning into saints. This is people who are far from God coming into the presence of God and seeing the face of God for the first time. I tell you, there is no blessing you will ever experience in your life that will outdo that. When you know that God used you in some small, very insignificant way, but still he chose to use you as a part of his process to change a sinner's life. You should want to be a part of that harvest. But we can't reap what we don't sow We can't harvest a field we won't work in. It's the Lord's harvest, and we get to participate in it. And we should desire to participate in it. But again, we have to understand that obeying God's principle is what actually produces this blessing in our life. I pray that every single one of you have an opportunity to lead somebody to the Lord in your life. You lead one person to the Lord, you ain't going to stop with one, I promise you that. Because you're going to feel that blessing, you're going to sense that blessing, you're going to want more of that blessing, and you're going to want to go out there and sow some more seeds and harvest some more. Many people, though, especially in today's day, have never led anybody to Christ. You don't know the blessing of this principle. It's there, you've just never tapped into it. In verse 38, Jesus outlines one way we can all participate in this. He says, therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest pray. We can all do that, can't we? You can pray. You can start right now praying for the harvest. Earlier this year, I got to go overseas and do some work with our underground church networks. By the way, three more churches have been planted. I got some pictures in this week of some more baptisms. Um, Yeah, it's incredible. One of the villages, one of our main planters uh, went into as far as we know, had never heard the gospel before, and there were like 13 people who came to know the Lord in the course of a week there. Pretty incredible thing. But one of the things I love the most about that trip, and one of the things that impacted me the most about that trip, is at 10.02 every morning over there, something special happened. At 10.02 every morning, all the believers' phones would start going off. Beep, 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 beep. They had different alarms set, but in unison, they would all go off. Because at 10.02, every morning, every believer over there prays for the harvest. They pray that God would send workers into the harvest field. And that God would give them the courage and the boldness to harvest whatever field he has them in. They do it at 10.02 because Luke 10.2 is Luke's version of what we just read in Matthew 9.38. I came back. I sent my phone to 1002 when I was over there and participated in that. Like I said, it was super impactful. I got back here to the States and I found for me 1002 didn't work very good. Um, I I mean, I did it for a while. It's just by 1002 in the morning, I was already full steam ahead. And I, I just, I found myself having these really short prayers or having to, you know, bow my head in the middle of a Zoom meeting and just say a really quick prayer when I was halfway distracted with what was going on. I didn't like that. And so I was reading through the gospel of Matthew. I read through a gospel every week. I do Matthew the first week of the month, so on and so forth. Four gospels. I do one every week. I read through it several times usually. But I was reading through Matthew, and I got to Matthew 9.38, and I said, you know what? 9.38 p.m. is a really good time for me. 
Because at 9.38 p.m., I'm starting to wind the day down, but I'm still focused and I'm still, uh, I'm still fresh. I'm usually getting ready right at that point to start doing my evening devotional, my evening prayer time. And so I set my alarm for 9.38 p.m. And so at 9.38 p.m. every day, my phone goes off. Beep, 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 beep. And it reminds me to pray for the harvest. So I wanted to challenge you and I wanted to encourage you right now. Get your phone out. Set your alarm, 10.02, 9.38, I don't care what it is. You can do a.m., you can do p.m. You do whatever time you think you're going to be the most focused and the most ready to pray for the harvest. And I want to challenge you for 30 days to set that alarm, seven days a week, let it go off, and when it goes off, pray. Wouldn't that be cool if we as a church just all prayed at 9.38 every night for the harvest of our county? for the harvest of our country, for the harvest of this world, that God would put laborers in the field, that God would use us as laborers for that harvest. I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll take the time to do it. And I think, I know, you're going to be blessed because the principle of the harvest is a blessing. The principle of the harvest works in regards to our generosity towards others. It works in regards to our generosity towards God. It works in regards to our generosity towards serving. It works in our efforts of evangelism. It works. Not because we believe it works. Not because what we believe about it makes it work. It works because it's God's principle. And when you understand and you obey God's principles, it produces blessings in your life. The principle of the harvest is an important one. The second one, the last one I'll talk to you about today is another important one. It's the principle of faith. Faith, it's important. Like the principle of the harvest, the principle of faith is another thing many people don't understand or don't really make any effort to obey in their lives. Some of you might disagree with me, and that's okay. You can be wrong. Um, It's a free country. You can be wrong about things. It's fine. Some of you might not agree with this, but I really don't think it takes much faith to live in America. It just doesn't. If you believe it takes great faith to live in America, you've probably never left America. You've probably never been to other parts of the world. It doesn't take much faith to live here where we live. And I know some of you are saying, yeah, but things are getting real hard, you know. The church is starting to be persecuted. The church is, yeah, things are harder today than they were 50 years ago, sure. Harder than they were 100 years ago? Absolutely. But listen, if you think it's hard right now, that just means you're really soft. Because nothing we're going through is hard. Nothing we're going through is tough. If you think what we're going through right now is hard, you're probably going to be part of those who fall away when things really get hard. Because this ain't tough. This ain't hard. It's not hard to live in America. It doesn't take much faith to live here. Let's face it. Our freedom, our security, our prosperity, our opportunities, our medical technology and medical personnel and medical facilities, our access to education and learning, all of these and many other things put us in a position where we can just trust and hope in other things besides God all the time. We can trust and hope in things we can see, things we can touch, things we can feel, things we can experience, things we can buy, things we can have right now because they're right at the edge of our fingertips instead of us having to really practice true faith. Now, we know what faith is thanks to verses like Hebrews 11.1, 1, which says, now faith is this, it's the reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not seen. But it's hard to live by that principle when everything you want, everything you can ever dream of, everything you could ever desire is right at your fingertips. And even if you can't get it today, you can probably get it tomorrow. And even if you can't afford it, somebody will loan you the money to get it. And even if you can't pay the loan, somebody will bail you out. It's hard to live by faith in a place like that. Because you're not forced to. You don't have to. And the reality is, is we all want to go on the path of least resistance. We all go the easy way. I do it too. And so we don't have to live by faith, and so therefore we don't. 
But I'm telling you, just like Archimedes' principle, faith is working all around you. It's present because it's a principle that God put into the DNA of creation. It's in the DNA of the universe in which you live. And if you start to understand it, and if you begin to obey it, it's going to open up an entirely new world that you've never been in before. Proverbs actually talks about the principle of faith like this. We've covered this verse in our series. It says this in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding, and in all your ways know him, and he will make your path straight. We've talked about that. It's easy to talk about it, though. It's hard to actually do it. But we see the principle of faith and the principle of the path intersect right here. They overlap right here. Trust God. Don't trust yourself. Desire to know him and him alone. That's the life of faith in a nutshell. And that's the principle that will make your paths straight. Now some of you might be thinking, well, but if I don't really need to live by faith to be here, and if I don't really need it to work where I work, and if I don't really need it because the doctor or the hospital can just jot down a quick prescription to make me feel better, if I don't really need faith because the Lord has allowed me in His sovereignty and His generosity and He's positioned me and planted me in the greatest country the world has ever known, in the greatest time of economic prosperity the world has ever known, and He's put me there, and if I don't really need it, why should I go through all the effort to live in faith? If I don't really need it, why should I do it? It's a good question. It's not a bad one. I'll give you the answer. It's found in Hebrews eleven six. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God. Since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. There's blessing in this principle. He rewards those who who seek him. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, I don't know about you. I'm assuming because you've shown up at church when you could have done other things, you're somebody who wants to please the Lord. I'm assuming that that you're somebody who wants to please God. But this tells us it is impossible to do that if we don't live in faith. And it's hard to live in faith where we live. You see, the principle of faith is an essential ingredient for pleasing God. Have you ever tried to bake something and left out an essential ingredient? You went to make that cake and you forgot the eggs? Go home and make you a pan of brownies and leave out the sugar. It ain't going to taste right. See, some of us are trying to live a life of faith without any faith at all. How can we please God if we're not putting the one essential ingredient that he says you've got to have into the recipe? We've got to have faith. I love the story in Mark chapter 9. I think it illustrates so many different aspects of faith and the principle of real faith. The passage starts when the disciples come across a boy who's possessed by a demon. His dad actually brought him. There's a crowd there, and they try to heal him, but they can't, apparently. When all the dust settles, after all the commotion of all this is over, in Mark chapter 9, verse 28, it says this, After he had gone into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? Why why couldn't we do it? In other words, Jesus, we want to do stuff like that. We want to be cool like you. They had tried, but they were unable to make a difference in the boy's life, in the boy's condition. And Jesus' response to their question in Mark is one thing, and we'll get to that. And his response to their question in Matthew, it's the same story, is a different response. It's actually the same response. I think Matthew just recorded one part of it, and Mark recorded the other. Matthew recorded it this way, Then the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we drive it out? And Jesus said, Because of your little faith. If we had time to dive deeper here, we would see that the real issue is that the disciples had become cocky. You see, they had driven demons out successfully before. And when this came in front of them, they said, well, we'll just do it ourselves. We'll just say some words and he'll come out. 
we'll just make this happen. But they hadn't prayed and they hadn't asked God for help. They weren't doing it in faith. They're essentially trying to do it on their own. It's why in Mark's gospel, the emphasis is actually not on their lack of faith, but on their lack of prayer. In Mark's gospel, Jesus says, because this, this one can only come out by prayer. And it wasn't one or the other. It wasn't a lack of one or the other. It was a lack of both. They hadn't prayed and they haven't prayed in faith. They were putting their faith in their own power. They were putting their faith in their past success. They were putting their faith in themselves, not in God, to do the work. That's why they couldn't do anything. They couldn't do anything, so the situation gets elevated to Jesus. Look at verse 21, Mark chapter 9. How long has this been happening to him, Jesus asked his father. From childhood, he said. And many times it's thrown him into the fire or the water trying to kill him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. In other words, Jesus said, hey, <clears throat> there's already a principle at work around you. You just haven't tapped into it yet. Everything's possible for the one who believes. It's, it's your faith here that we've got to talk about. There's already a principle of faith. You don't believe in it. You haven't seen it. You haven't experienced it. But it's already here. If you can. Jesus says, if I can. Who do you think I am? Who do I look like? Some two-bit medicine man who just rolled into town? If I can... Do I seem like some fly-by-night psychiatrist to you? If I can, do you think I'm just some eloquent self-help guru that's got a new shiny book that's here peddling it and trying to get you to buy it? If I can, he says, you're talking to the Son of God, man. Of course I can. The question isn't, can I? Jesus says, if I can, hold my Bible. <laughs> you know? Step back. I'm fixing to show you something. He didn't say that, but that's kind of what he says. He says, if you can, well, of course I can. Everything's possible for the one who believes. Of course I can do it. The question is, can you do it? The question is, can you believe it? Of course it's possible, but you've got to believe. There's a principle of faith already all around you. The question is, can you tap into it? Yeah, it's possible, but can you believe it? In other words, he says, I can, but can you? And I just love the honesty of this boy's father, and if you're a father, you've got to feel for him. This guy's not a deacon at his local church. I mean, he's not a well-versed person in Scripture. He's just, he's just a dad trying to help his boy. He's never tapped into this faith thing before. And it says in verse 24, Immediately the father of the boy cried out, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Don't you love that? I'm believing with everything I've got, Jesus. I'm believing with every ounce of me and trying to believe in every way I possibly know I can believe. But if I'm not believing enough, could you help me with that too? I have faith, but I'm also struggling with my faith. So help me with my faith. You see, the principle of faith was already wor at work around this man and in his boy and in his life. He just hadn't tapped into it. He didn't invent the principle of faith here. Been there since the beginning of time. But understanding and obeying God's principles is what produces blessings in your life. And the result here is the boy is healed. The power of God and the principle of faith work in tandem together for the glory of God and the expansion of the kingdom. Because faith matters. Faith works. Faith makes a difference. Faith is important. Faith is the foundation of our faith. You know where we all start our journey? I started my journey in the same place you started yours. We all started in faith. 
We all took a step of faith. We put our faith in Christ to forgive us of our sins. We put our faith in Jesus to wash us clean. We put our faith in him to save our souls. We put our faith in him to set us free. We left the comfort of trusting ourselves and trusting our ways and trusting what we had. And we joined him in the adventure of a lifetime in faith. Paul said it like this to the Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For you are saved by grace through faith. It's the only way to be saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 says this, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. This is how we know that we love God's children, when we love God and obey his commands. For this is what love for God is, to keep his commands, and his commands are not a burden, because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. But it doesn't end there. Look at this last part. This is the victory that has conquered the world. What is it? Our faith. And so many of us haven't tapped into it. The victory that conquers the world, y'all. This is for everyone who believes in faith. There's victory in that. This is the victory that has conquered the world. Our faith. My friends, this is the day of victory for the lost. This is the day of victory for every sinner. This is the day of victory for those who are far from God. This is the day of victory. This is the house of victory because it's the victor's house. He's the God of victory. We echo the hope of victory as Paul declared to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, if you're in need of victory today, repent of your sins, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you'll find victory because you will be saved. Let's pray. If you're here, if you can hear my voice this hour and you need that victory, you need that salvation, we invite you to pray with us. Call on him. Take that step of faith. Tap in to this great principle that will change your life and your eternity forever. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So, Lord, I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. I ask by faith that you would make me new, that you would make me whole. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me of my sins. I thank you for your grace and your goodness your love and your mercy and for helping me even in my unbelief Lord as we close this hour I know there's much need of victory in this place some need a victory in their marriage some it's in their finances maybe it's with a friend or a family member another relationship Father, some of us need a victory over our anxiety and our fears. Some of us need a victory over some kind of trauma that happened to us decades ago, but it still haunts us. It holds us. Father, some of us are so scared of tomorrow that we don't want to go to sleep tonight. Lord, there's all kinds of different ways people need victory, but... There's only one way to get any of it, and that's through Jesus. So I pray instead of looking for victory in our bank accounts and looking for victory in our medicines and our doctors, looking for victory, Father, in our wisdom, or whatever new shiny book has come out, Lord, I pray that we would just look into your word, that 
we would obey the principles that are already there working around us, that we would tap into those. Lord, help us to tap into faith and to tap into the principle of the harvest. Lord, I thank you that you've given it to us. I just pray we'd have the courage to accept it and tap into it. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, and we honor you today in Jesus' name.